Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center. Welcome to this conference on Alexander Vasilyev's notebooks and the documentation of Soviet intelligence operations in the United States, 1930 to 1950. I'm Christian Osterman, and I direct the History and Public Policy program here at the Wilson Center. And the program, of course, includes our Cold War International History project, uh, with which many of you are, are more familiar with. Um, over the past almost two decades now, the Cold War International History Project has collected, translated, and disseminated new evidence from former communist world archives. We've done that uh, through our network of scholars and archivists um, and colleagues throughout the world. We do so th um, through our website, www.cwihp.org. And we do so through our Cold War Project Bulletin, copies of which will be available in the course of this um, seminar. <coughs> this conference essentially continues this effort by making available to scholars and the general public new, we think, important new sources on one aspect of the early Cold War, the Vasiliev notebooks, some 1,100 or so pages of densely, densely handwritten notes um, taken by Alexander Vasiliev, which contain a lot of information on Soviet intelligence operations in the United States from 1930 to 19 about 1950. The project has published these materials in the original form as well as in transcribed and translated versions on its website at www, again, www.cwihp.org, and they are freely available to anybody interested in the subject. I invite you to log on to our website and take a look. Let me state very clearly and very loudly here that we do not take here at the center and at the project any positions on the notebooks, nor do we endorse any one interpretation of these materials. We try to make these materials publicly available in as raw a fashion as possible so that scholars and the public alike can use them and make up their own mind about the conclusions. And we tr try to provide context and critique by bringing together some of the leading specialists to share with you, to share with us, their analyses and findings. We've published similar materials in the past, and we're eager to publish and make available additional documentation in years to come. Let me add that the Vasiliev collection, which was featured in Slashdot.org, a user-driven news website which receives some 5 million visitors per month. As a result, we almost brought down the Wilson Center website <laughs> yesterday. Um, but I'm happy to see that a good fourth, fifth of these uh, 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 users um, came from Russia, came in from Russia. The KGB archives, as most of you are familiar, the KGB archives remain closed. But over the past two decades, we've seen a trickling out of new materials from Russia and elsewhere. Scholars, some of whom are here today, have eagerly seized these new sources. But they are, of course, very problematic due to their fragmentary nature their uncertain provenance, their lack of archival context, and they, and they, not surprisingly, have given rise to considerable controversy. As long as the KGB archives remain closed, therefore, caution this upfront is warranted as we look at these new sources, and we need to keep their limitations very much in mind. This applies, this too applies to the collection that we're going to talk about today, the collection of materials we will discuss over the next couple of days, the Vasiliev notebooks. Alexander Vasiliev, a former KGB officer turned journalist, was given the opportunity to spend a couple of years working with materials from the KGB archive, and he was allowed to take detailed notes, including extended verbatim, verbatim quotes on some of the KGB's most sensitive files. 
in their quantity and scope, they go well beyond many of the other materials that have become available. But they are, of course, not the original thing. And as Vasiliev himself points out, even his access was not unfettered. And so they have to be analyzed very carefully and with the co when the within the context of other sources and the scholarship already available, and that's what we're seeking to do here today. We hope that this meeting will contribute to, a broadening, to broadening the discussion of what no doubt is a major new set of materials on the history of Soviet intelligence. The notebooks were provided to the project by John Haynes, Harvey Clare, and Mr. Vasiliev, co-authors, of course, of Spies, The Rise and Fall of the KGB in America, an important new publication that is based on the notebooks. John Harvey and Mr. Vasiliev will talk in a few minutes about how they obtained and used the notebooks and to what conclusions they have come in their book. Let me thank them and give them credit and give credit to the three authors for making these materials available to the public. I wish more authors in this field would lay open their cards and allow others to use and exploit the documentation their works are based on. It is my understanding that the original notebooks will be publicly accessible at the Library of Congress, and I believe Dr. Haynes will um, talk about this, uh, maybe willing to um, share more information in a short while. The Vasiliev notebooks contain far more information than Haynes, Claire, and Vasiliev could use for their book, despite the fact that it is a fat one, a fat volume. <laughs> so we teamed up with Harvard Harvard Project for Cold War Studies, directed by Mark Kramer, who will be here shortly. He's here. He's is here. here. He is here. Wonderful. Uh, has, is, is here with us today. And the contributors to a forthcoming June 2009 special edition of the Journal of Cold War Studies to look at a variety of key subjects, uh, some which go beyond uh, the volume, um, uh, the, the spies volume. Today's session features the authors, and today's and tomorrow's sessions feature the authors of this edition of the journal, along with a number of other leading scholars to comment on the presentations. Let me thank all of you, all of the contributors present here for joining us today, particularly those such as Mr. Vasiliev, who have traveled from afar to be here today. Let me say a few things on procedure at the outset be before I turn it over to um, Jim Hirschberg, my predecessor as director of the Cold War Project and now professor of history at George Washington University. He will, he will moderate the first session. This is a scholarly institution. This is a scholarly seminar, and I expect presentations and interjections to be carried out in the appropriate scholarly manner. I think it would benefit the discussion if we can refer as much as possible and as specifically as possible to the notebooks as the central source on the discussion here and other sources, other source materials, rather than engage in general discussion on subjects about, about which I fully realize many of you, many of the participants here today have argued for many years and will most likely argue for many years, continue to argue for many years. The question here today is to what extent do the Vasiliev notebooks share new light on certain issues and what are their value and limitations? Having said that, I would also appreciate if everybody here today could keep in mind that our audience, the audience here in the room and the audience out there, this session is being webcast the audience out there is a general one, not just intelligence and espionage specialists. So I would appreciate if we can avoid extensive use of acronyms and jargon <laughs> that is not easily accessible to non-specialists. Finally, we have a lot of material to cover. We have a lot of talent here in the room and time is limited. So we have asked the speakers today and tomorrow's sessions to limit their presentations as much as possible to hopefully just about 10 or 15 or so minutes to, al to allow as much for as much discussion as possible. 
we have some uh, great talent in the room, not just among the panelists, but also within the audience. We see Ray Gartoff here, one of the preeminent historians. Um, there are others uh, that I see in the back of the room. Um, I think um, we would very much like to bring everybody uh, into this conversation. This means that interjections, too, from the larger group should also be kept short and to the point. The point of today's meeting is to begin a discussion of the Vasily of Notebooks, the Spies publication, and to bring in new and a broad range of perspectives and voices into this debate. I wish us all two exciting, exhilarating, fruitful days of discussion and conversation and look forward to all of your contributions. Let me, in closing, thank um, my staff, in particular um, Timothy McDonald, wherever he may be at the moment, uh, probably all the way in the corner there, uh, for uh, really making it happen that we're, we can all gather here today, as well as Yale University Press and Emory University for their support. With that, let me turn it over to my colleague Jim Hirschberg to start us off with the first session. Jim. Thank you, Christian. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming. It, it's a great privilege and honor uh, to be chairing this session. I, I can also testify from uh, having cracked open the book that this is uh, a, a very exciting moment to, to get this deeply uh, into this story. Uh, in, in my case, I started on uh, a, a study of someone, one of the documents uh, identifies as one of the War Department's scientific henchmen. James Conant, who is president of Harvard University, um, and uh, have already learned things about J. Robert Oppenheimer that I've waited decades for, and some of you have waited even several more decades for than I have. So we have a very exciting subject. I don't want to delay uh, moving to the presentations and to what I guess Lawrence Spivak might have called our live and unrehearsed uh, discussion uh, afterwards. I just uh, want to just make a procedural comment. Um, I believe the focus of the panel today is going to uh, be the provenance and the um, substance and uh, the parameters of the notebooks themselves. And keep in mind that we do have two dedicated sessions tomorrow, uh, first on his stone and counterintelligence, then on atomic and technical espionage. So um, f on those topics, you might consider at least um, holding your fire uh, rather than allowing us to get deeply into uh, conversations that might be more fruitful tomorrow after more of that evidence has been presented. Uh, I'm not going to uh, take up a lot of time with detailed introductions. All of you, I hope, have received the biographical uh, summaries. And, and actually, frankly, um, most of the folks up here don't need too much introduction. So uh, we are going to start off uh, with the person who is responsible for uh, this contribution to knowledge most directly, Alexander Vasiliev. Then we'll move to uh, his co-authors, John Earl Haynes and Harvey Clare. So let's start with Alexander. Oh, uh, hello. I'm Alexander Vasiliev. <coughs> uh, I wrote the notebooks. Uh, I'm not an English native speaker, so if you don't understand me, please feel free to stop me and ask again, OK? Alexander, turn on the mic. Is it on? OK. Of course, I mean. <laughs> Did no, no, so uh, I, I, ju I just want to repeat that I'm not an English speaker, a native, and uh, if you don't understand me, please uh, stop me and ask again. Um, first of all, I would like to say that this book wouldn't be possible without uh, John Haynes and uh, Harvey Clare, and uh, I uh, felt extremely honored to, to work with them for three years, and um, I knew them by reputation. Um, imagine a, new mus um, a young musician who was invited to play on stage with uh, Simon and Garfunkel. <laughs> this is how I felt. <laughs> uh, I'm Simon. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you, are, you are both number one. You are very <laughs> um, now I have to tell this uh, story which I already told about a hundred times and it's in the introduction. Uh, I will try to make it short and then I will answer all your questions as, as far as I can. Uh, the project started in 1993. Uh, there was, before that there was a book um, 
The Deadly Illusions by uh, John Costello and Oleg Tsarev, which actually was the beginning of the whole story, and uh, that book was launched, with, uh, as far as I remember, with the permission of the chairman of the KGB, Krichkov. So in 1993, they decided to continue this experience, and they um, signed a contract with the uh, Crown, subsidiary of Random House. Um, I, didn't ha I didn't take a part, any part in, um, in the negotiations, so I don't know much about, about the contract. I was invited by Yuri Kabalazu, who was at the time the press, of, uh, the press uh, uh, officer of the Russian intelligence service to take part on, um, uh, in, uh, in this project to, to do a book on the espionage in the United States with Alan Weinstein. The American side, the Crown, chose their, their authors and uh, the Russian side, uh, in this case, uh, Yuri chose um, uh, the Russian authors. Uh, I started to work with the files in uh, January of 1994. I worked in um, the press office of the Russian intelligence services not far from Lubyanka. It, it, was, it was situated in Kalpachny Street, uh, number 13. Now, the several years ago, they moved to a new place. Uh, oh, from my previous experience, uh, of uh, working in the KGB. I, I used to work uh, for two and a half years in the U.S. Department of the First Chief Directorate of the KGB. And before that, for two years, I, uh, I studied in uh, Andropov's Red Banner Institute of the KGB, which is the spy school. So from my previous experience, I more or less knew the structure of the files, and uh, I asked to start to, to bring me the so-called... Uh, operational correspondence files. These are the files which contain miscellaneous information, uh, uh, letters, cables uh, between stations and the center. In this case, between the stations in, uh, in the United States, mostly uh, in New York, station, uh, New York Station. Um, the first notebook was the, uh, the, black, the black notebook. So if you have a look at the beginning of it, you will get a feeling uh, what I saw initially when they started bringing me the files for 1933, when uh, the NKVD decided, well, tried to figure out what they used to have before uh, in early 30s and maybe in the 20s. And uh, the information was very scarce and patchy. And uh, you can feel it, you can see it uh, reading the beginning of uh, the black book, of the black notebook. But um, I h must admit, I, I didn't know much uh, about espionage history. Still don't know much. Uh, this I, I, w I was practically clean on this matter, uh, but I thought that was good because I could, s could s see things with an, with an open mind. I, um, I consider myself a good journalist and researcher, quite meticulous, so I... Um, I started uh, as any good journalist would start. Uh, I was um, writing down all the names, cover names, hoping that somewhere, you know, in the future they will become something, you know, more important. Uh, any bit of uh, meaningful information. Step by step, I was uh, gathering these cover, na cover names and real names. You know, sometimes they used real names. Sometimes uh, in the document there could be a, there would be um, a cover name, and on the margin of this document, someone many years ago wrote the real name with a pen or a pencil. Uh, quite early in in my work, I uh, came across um, uh, the list which was composed by Anatoly Gorsky in uh, 1948, I think. And uh, that was a list of uh, cover names and real names of the agents, and uh, that helped me a lot. So I started asking uh, the files, the personal files. That's second another category which I needed. Personal files which contain information about uh, this particular agent. But... Uh, the thing is that sometimes they don't necessarily contain all the information. Sometimes you would find 
uh, information in uh, operational correspondence files which wasn't which is not in the, in the personal file uh, they didn't care much in the 90s and uh, in the 1930s and 40s about bureaucracy and that's why files are, are you know are, are really it's, it's very difficult to work with them uh, there is no they are not sy systematized they're they are they are not indexed um, and uh, I, I guess I guess the operatives at the time kept the documents in their um, in their uh, drawers in, in, in or in the somewhere and then uh, sometime after they put them in in the file just not and do, doing it as uh, as quickly as possible because there is no order at all you would uh, find uh, a cable from New York to Moscow in, in one file and uh, a response to that cable in a totally different file. Uh, so it was difficult. On the other hand, uh, it helped me a lot the fact that there, there, was no in there, there were no indexes in the files because uh, no one, in the even in the archives, know exactly what these files contain. Right? They are not nobody knows. Uh, a beautiful story was uh, with uh, Samuel Dickstein, the U.S. congressman, uh, whom I discovered, you know, by, by lucky chance. Uh, uh, I f first I found uh, his cover name Crook, and uh, then I asked, and I, I realized that this must be somebody in Washington in the Congress. Uh, I asked for, for the file, and that was, uh, no, Samuel Dickstein. And that was a revelation not only for me, that was a revelation for the Russian intelligence service. <laughs> uh, they had no idea they, ha they had such a source. <laughs> um, also, an another story is uh, Ernst Hemingway. Uh, we have a chapter on Hemingway in, um, in, in our book, and um, nobody knew that he was in contact with the uh, Soviet operatives. He wasn't an agent. But uh, he was, um, uh, as far as I remember, contacted in uh, New York, London, and then in Cuba. And he was ready to cooperate, to work. And he knew with whom he was dealing with because he gave stamps as a material password. So that, that, that were amazing discoveries, not only for me, but also for the Russian intelligence service. Now, I was doing this um, work for two years. and. Um, uh, somewhere in 1995, I started uh, doing uh, uh, writing the chapters. I was supposed to present the chapters uh, for verification to the, to a panel, <coughs> to the Declassification Commission, uh, which uh, members of the Declassification Commission were heads of different departments, and uh, I guess uh, Mr. Primakov, who was the head of the service at the moment was a member to Yuri Kabaladze was a member in, in, of the commission. So I could give this material to, to my co-author Alan Weinstein only after the chapters were released by the commission. Now, <coughs> uh, the thing started slowing down in 1995, uh, f mostly for political reasons and uh, the uh, didn't want didn't want to release uh, a chapter on the atomic espionage. Uh, then in January 1996, uh, they stopped the project. They closed it down. Um, I don't have much time actually. Uh, uh, well, we moved to London in May 1996. Before that. Um, uh, before going to the to the Sheremetyevo tour. I, uh, uh, I, I had, yeah, I, it's, it's important. I could, I could keep the notebooks uh, at home. Now, while, while I was working with a notebook uh, in the press bureau, it was kept in, in a safe box of one of the officers, mostly of uh, Yuri Kabaladze or Oleg Tsarev. But when I filled this, uh, filled up this notebook, I could take it home and I kept it at home, and I could uh, write my chapters at home. Um, that was actually 
uh, full-time job, and uh, I was glad I was uh, I was working at the time as a columnist for the Komsomolska Pravda, and I had uh, I didn't have to come to the office every day, and uh, I could 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 write at home. So I, instead of this, I came every day to the to the press bureau, the Russian intelligence service, to ro to work with the files, and I was, and I did it for two years uh, uh, without any vacations. Um, so when uh, when we decided to move to London, I um, uh, I copied all the chapters, uh, the rush in Russian and uh, what I had in English. Oh my I'm not sure. I I, I'm not, no, I think I translated them already in London. All the chapters I, I copied all the chapters on floppy disks, and uh, I deleted all the files from my laptop. Because I, I was afraid I would be um, at the customs; they would want to to look what I what I had in my uh, in my laptop. So I, I copied them on my floppy disk. I put uh, the floppy disks in uh, in in one of my bags uh, and went to Sheremetyevo. In London, I um, well we met with Alan soon after my arrival, and we started working here in Washington, and I me, me in London. Uh, so this is the way it was done. I mean, um, do you think I should add something? Maybe a comment about retrieving the notebooks. Ah, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, my trials. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I sued uh, a, a couple of organizations in, t in the year 2001, Amazon.com and uh, the journal uh, Intelligence and Security uh, Journal, which published, uh, the journal published an article by John Lowenthal and uh, Amazon.com published uh, his uh, comment on the haunted wood. I sued both of them. Uh, I was a litigant in person, which in, in British English means I represented myself. I didn't have any money and I couldn't find a law, law firm which could uh, take my case on no win, no fee basis, so I decided to do it on my own. And uh, I realized that um, I needed my notebooks as evidence, so I asked a friend of mine in Moscow to send them to me, and which he did by DHL, and <laughs> they they arrived safely. Uh, thank you, DHL. Uh, and uh, uh, oh th this is how I I got my notebooks. The difference between my first book, The Haunted Wood, and this one is uh, is enormous. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the Haunted Wood was written on the basis of my chapters which I wrote in Russian then translated them in English and on the basis of the material Alan Weinstein had in Washington. Um, uh, as I said, I'm not a professional historian and I think that affected the quality of The Haunted Wood because uh, someti sometimes I didn't know what I had what we did with this book, uh, first of all, I, I typed this, ev everything I had in my <coughs> notebooks uh, you know, on, on a laptop, then it was translated by two professional uh, translators into, into English. Then uh, John and Harvey read them and they saw things I didn't see. <coughs> For instance, they saw the material on Eye of Stone. That's why Eye of Stone is not in the haunted wood. I had no idea who he was. Simple as that. I am still bewildered by the fact that people are talking about him so much, but it's, well, it's up to you. <laughs> um, so uh, th this is uh, the difference between uh, these two books. Um, well, that's it. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Let me turn the floor over to uh, John Earl Haynes from the Library of Congress to talk about digesting the notebooks, transcription, translation, and concordance preparation. I'm going to talk about uh, what we did once the notebooks. Once the notebooks were uh, uh, translated. John. John. Oh, 
about yours. Uh, here we are. All right, here is an image of one of the original notebooks, the one called Odd Pages. Uh, and what was done next after, after we had uh, those It's, of course, much easier for translators to work uh, from uh, transcription. The, uh, the translators had that available. Uh, Alexander himself uh, transcribed the notebooks, which was, uh, even though he had very neat uh, and, and legible handwriting, he, of course, knows his own, own uh, handwriting the best, and so to have him transcribe uh, the handwritten into uh, Russian uh, tr uh, word process Russian was uh, extremely helpful. The translators uh, then produced the actual translation. And one thing you will notice is that we formatted the translations in the same way as the original. So that what's on page uh, 35 of, of the original Odd Pages notebook is the same material as on page 35 of the transcription uh, and on page 35 of the translation, including his, uh, his uh, marginal uh, habits. On the, in the left-hand margin, uh, Alexander would put the page number from the particular archival file he was working with. And on the right-hand margin, he would, uh, he would often write his own interjections and comments and questions to himself about, um, about what he was looking at. Now, once the translations were in Harvey's hands and my hands, uh, we had to uh, undertake a second uh, operation. There are a lot of names and a lot of cover names uh, in this material. One of the first things was to try to get the cover names straight. And one of our immediate problems that came up is when I realized in reading these different notebooks that uh, someone whose cover name was translated, let's say, Bugle in one of the notebooks, the same guy seemed to be showing up in another notebook under a, a different uh, cover name, Forge. And at first I thought it was two different cover names, but then uh, I did have the good sense to take a look at the original Russian and realize they were simply alternative translations of the same original Russian word. So I had to, at that point, uh, create an index in, of the Russian for all the cover names to make sure that the translators were being uniform in the English translation uh, that they made uh, of these cover names. Then there's a question of, of which one of the alternative translations to use. Now, one of the considerations that went into that was that many of these cover names also show up in the Venona decryptions, where translators for uh, the Venona project made choices about what, uh, what translation to use. Our decision was that it would confuse people enormously if we chose a different translation from that already used by, uh, by the Venona project. So with one or two exceptions, and there are some technical reasons for that, whenever a cover name showed up in Venona and was translated in a certain fashion, uh, we would translate it the same way here, simply to avoid confusion uh, of uh, two historians and researchers who are going back and forth between them. Another problem that, uh, that quickly became clear to us is this, the actual spelling of many of the American names. Most of the names are in these Russian files in phonetic Cyrillic, not in Latin alphabet English. And in most cases, when, it's, when it is translated back into English, the spelling comes out correctly, but not in all cases. In some cases, the spelling uh, is not at all the way it is in English because, you know, as, as we all know, 
it is possible to spell a name in English several different ways. And the transliteration systems don't always uh, catch that. Classic one, for example, is Earl Browder, the chairman of the, of the Communist Party in the 30s and 40s. Uh, in virtually all of the transliteration systems uh, that are used, when his name is transliterated back from the Russian into English, it comes out B-R-A-U-D-E-R, -E which, of course, is Browder. But that's not how he spelled it. He spelled it B-R-O-W-D-E-R. -E Phonetically, there's no difference. So you have, to, you have to look at the translations of some of these English names and make sure that the spelling uh, came out right. Uh, there was also the problem of, uh, of names where only a family name was given, a last name, and it isn't clear who this person is. So you have to do a bit of research on what agency are they in, what the context is, the date and all of that, to figure out the exact person and make sure the spelling uh, came out right. So uh, I had to create a concordance, uh, which you see here, which is available on the website, where uh, you can go back and forth, it's alphabetical in Latin, uh, alphabet. Um, uh, the cover names are listed, the Russian uh, uh, is listed, and the translation and the real names are all listed. Uh, so you can, uh, that gives you much more intellectual control uh, uh, as you go through the notebooks. Uh, also to keep in mind that cover names change from time to time, and sometimes cover names were reused. Uh, so one needs to look at the cover name in the, in the concordance to see if it was used cons consistently for one person or if it was shifted to another person at some later date. Uh, the concordance itself is quite long, uh, about 180 pages uh, in its printed form. Uh, so it was uh, a lot of work, but absolutely necessary in order to uh, keep intellectual control over in the uh, notebooks. And I do encourage those who make use of the notebooks to uh, go to the concordance uh, about who you're interested in first. Uh, it'll make life a lot easier for you uh, as you go through the notebooks themselves. Uh, a few other comments about how uh, we did this. Uh, uh, as I made corrections in the spellings of names or tried to make the cover name translations uniform, uh, we also uh, referred all of this back to Alexander for him to read, and uh, he also made his corrections and comments uh, as we went along. Uh, and the, in the actual writing of the text itself, uh, which Harvey and I wrote uh, the original uh, drafts, except for Alexander, of course, wrote his own introduction, uh, that was then sent to Alexander for his review and his own editing and comment and recommendations. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this book truly is a co-authored project of the three of us, uh, and uh, it has been, I think, a very fruitful uh, collaboration. Um, on some of the conventions about how we cite material, uh, some of the conventions about how uh, we present cover names, uh, there is a section on that in the, in the early part of the book, um, uh, conventions on, uh, on citation and uh, acronyms and cover names. Um, uh, you can find that. Um, and at that point, I would like to stop here, and then um, Harvey will be talking about the actual substance of the book. Okay, turn over to Harvey Clare from Emory University. Thank you. Uh, Boiling down the mountains of information in Alexander's notebooks into a slightly less enormous book was hard enough. Uh, to compress the material from a 700-page book into 15 minutes is truly daunting. Uh, in the brief time I have this afternoon to highlight some of the more significant findings in Spies, I will just mention very briefly a, a number of issues and themes that will be discussed more fully and in greater depth in tomorrow's panels. Uh, I do so quite reluctantly since they are also some of the most interesting, historically significant, and controversial parts of the book. First, we present new and I think even more compelling evidence to add to the already overwhelming evidence that Alger Hiss was a Soviet spy, including a Soviet intelligence report from 1950 that identifies him as a GRU agent convicted of espionage in an American court. Secondly, we provide a wealth of new detail on enormous, the Soviet effort to steal atomic bomb secrets, including identifying a long-sought agent codenamed Fogel and later Persian, 
who had turned over information about the Oak Ridge atomic facility. He was Russell McNutt, an engineer, and most surprisingly to us, he had been recruited by Julius Rosenberg. We also identified the British atomic spy, codenamed Eric Engelbert Broda, an emigre Austrian physicist. We provide a name for the source codenamed Quantum in Venona. He was a well-known physicist named Boris Podolsky, who never worked for the Manhattan Project, but apparently had learned some details about uranium separation and offered them to the USSR for money and a chance to move to Russia. Uh, wary of his trustworthiness and concerned that he had no real access to secrets, the KGB brushed him aside. <coughs> and I think just as significant, we establish conclusively that Robert Oppenheimer, head of the Los Alamos Scientific Project, was not a Soviet source, although not for lack of Soviet effort to make him one. Thirdly, we confirm that the Soviets successfully recruited I.F. Stone in 1936 and that he worked with them at least until 1938 and probably into 1939. Fourthly, we fill in virtually all the remaining blanks about the operation of the ring of communist spies led by Julius Rosenberg, including identifying McNutt and Nathan Sussman confirming that Ethel Rosenberg, while playing a very minor role, did actively assist in recruiting her brother, David Greenglass, for espionage and detailing the frantic Soviet effort to save the Rosenbergs. Some of the information in the notebooks offered genuine surprises. One was the revelation that from 1934 to early 1937, the KGB, and, and I should Note that for simplicity, we use that term to refer to all the acronyms by which the Soviet Foreign Intelligence Service was known. Um, that from 34 to early 37, uh, the KGB had a valuable source at the State Department. David Salmon, a veteran civil servant with no communist background whatsoever, was being paid more than his government salary. As chief of the State Department's Division of Communications and Records, he had access to all American diplomatic communications and ciphers. The Soviets never had direct access to Salmon. He had been recruited and run by Ludwig Lorry, a one-time Communist Party functionary who had been expelled from the Communist Party for Trotskyism. When the KGB broke its ties to Lorry in 1937, due to well-founded suspicions that he had invented fictitious spies to pad his own bank account, it lost contact with Salmon. The book also identifies numerous other government employees and scientists who cooperated with Soviet intelligence. Abraham Glasser worked in the Justice Department in the 1930s with access to military intelligence files. Gerald Grays at the Civil Service Commission could identify federal employees discontented with their work or salaries. His brother Stanley Grays cooperated with the Soviets while working for the OSS in London during World War II. Stanley's story is one of the more remarkable sagas in American history. Fired from the United Nations in 1952 after invoking the Fifth Amendment in response to a question about whether he had been a Soviet spy, Stanley later went to work for Robert Vesco and pleaded the Fifth Amendment in response to questions about his participation in Vesco's looting of mutual funds. Named in the then largest SEC civil complaint in American history, he was later indicted along with Vesco and fled the United States, dying in Costa Rica. So far as we can tell, the only man in American history to plead self-incrimination to questions about both espionage and large-scale financial fraud. James Hibben headed the chemical division of the U.S. Tariff Commission from 1939 until his death in 1959. He was briefly investigated by the FBI, which never learned 
that he was the agent codenamed Solid in the Venona messages. Earl Flosdorf, a biochemist who taught at the University of Pennsylvania, had an expensive hobby, collecting antique cars, and he transmitted information to the KGB on his research on bac bacteriological warfare in return for payments. He killed his wife in 1958 and then shot himself. Ernest Hemingway, as Alexander mentioned, met several times with KGB agents, agreed to be helpful, but never provided any information despite several efforts to use him. The notebooks also established the importance of William Weisband as one of the most destructive spies in American history. Beginning as a courier in the 1930s, the Russian-born Weisband turned into a source himself after his linguistic abilities led to his working for the Army's Signal Security Agency during World War II. Hired to work at Arlington Hall after the war, he was in an ideal position to alert the Soviets to American successes in code breaking. Vasilyev's notebooks document that Weinstein, uh, I'm sorry, the Weiss Band was, as long suspected, the source who informed the Soviets that American code breakers were reading their military logistics communications. One long-standing puzzle has been why it was not until 1948 that the USSR implemented more secure codes. We now know, thanks to the notebooks, that Weissband had been deactivated because of security concerns after Bentley's defection and contact with him had not been reestablished until 1948. He immediately told the KGB about the American breakthrough, crippling the United States' ability to monitor Soviet military logistics in the run-up to the Korean War. And these are just a few of the fascinating stories that are told in these notebooks. The men and women recruited by the KGB were not all dedicated communists, working for love of the Soviet Union, although many, indeed most of them, were. Some were mercenaries. A few had deep-seated resentments at their employers. And there were a handful of adventurers who enjoyed the atmosphere of secrecy and conspiracy. Even the communists were anything but automatons. Martha Dodd Stern regaled one of her KGB couriers with tales of her amorous adventures in Germany while ferreting out secrets. She had slept, the courier reported to Moscow, with a veritable international brigade of diplomats, <laughs> military officials, and outright Nazis. Soviet officers and couriers often found themselves acting as social workers, mediating marital difficulties, counseling about employment woes, or in one case, a, a complaint by Faye Glasser that her role as an agent was slighted because of male chauvinism shown to her husband, Harold. For all its achievements, the KGB's efforts were not always crowned with success. The subtitle of our book, The Rise and Fall of the KGB in America, actually refers to two cycles of activity. During the 1930s, the KGB built up a very successful espionage operation recruiting a number of high-value sources, providing diplomatic, political, and military secrets. Then, beginning in 1938, it systematically destroyed much of what it had created, recalling to Moscow the heads of the American station and many of its officers, and shooting them as alleged Trotskyite spies and wreckers. Convinced that many of its sources were worthless, Moscow had no one left to meet even with those like Michael Strait and Larry Duggan, whom it considered very valuable. In 1941, one report noted that only two of the American station's 15 officers had been in the United States for more than two years, and only four spoke English fluently. The Nazi attack on the Soviet Union required a very rapid rebuilding of its espionage capabilities, and Moscow soon dispatched experienced new officers to the United States. 
But the new station chief quickly concluded that the most useful and available sources of information were the Communist Party of the United States networks of sources gathered and run by Jacob Golis, an influential member of the American Party's leadership and an old KGB contact. The professional spies of the KGB were appalled by the lax security in these networks, their tendency to function like party cells, and their overall lack of conspiratia, but had no choice but to use them. They began a campaign to wrest control from Golis, and following his death in 1943, slowly pushed Elizabeth Bentley, his lover and successor, out of the picture. The effort to establish direct control over these networks and her increasing irrelevance led Bentley to the FBI in 1945 and the destruction of the Soviet's golden age of espionage. While a handful of spies remained in place, notably Judith Coplin and William Weisband, American counterintelligence would never again be as far behind the curve as it had been during and before and during World War II. The spies identified in the notebooks and profiled in our book did significant damage to American interests and provided crucial aid to the Soviet Union for many years. Not everyone we discussed stole secrets. Some worked as couriers, as talent spotters, or ran safe houses. Not everyone recruited by Soviet intelligence provided valuable information. The KGB wasted considerable resources on wild goose chases and a mania to destroy the tiny Trotskyist movement in the United States. But it also took advantage of monetary inducements and far more often ideological sympathy to persuade hundreds of Americans to agree to cooperate with its activities and it reaped a very rich reward. Thank you. Thank you. For some initial commentaries, we'll now turn uh, to Mark Kramer and, uh, of Harvard and then Catherine Sibley of St. Joseph's. Start with Mark. Okay, um, thank you, Jim. Um, let me also thank the Cold War International History Project for putting together, or uh, sponsoring this conference and um, and especially Alexander Vasiliev, John Earl Haynes, and Harvey Clare uh, for their work. The, um, I'm going to comment uh, a bit on the sources themselves and then just to say a couple of quick words about the significance. But I want to comment uh, um, in particular on the sources. Uh, in April 2006, Harvey and John convened a, a very small workshop in, uh, in Washington, D.C. here at the Library of Congress. And that, that uh, um, was designed to bring together a, a small group of experts to assess these sources to see whether this was a project worth pursuing and so forth. Alexander uh, was at that conference, the, uh, I'm sorry, the, at that workshop and was available for extensive questioning and the like. Now, the first thing I did at that workshop was to start going through Alexander's notebooks. As he'll recall, I would spend most of the next couple of days just going through them, sometimes asking him for uh, what a word was because sometimes they were um, uh, a little bit unclear. But for the most part, I found them quite easy to read uh, very small handwriting, but, but still, it um, immediately became apparent to me, as it was to John and Harvey, uh, the significance of these. And then, because Alexander was there, I had an opportunity to question him at some length. And I have to confess, this is no offense, but um, I, I initially was very apprehensive um, before I met him to what he would be like. I have met other former KGB officers before whom I haven't particularly relished. Um, and I, I was, I, you know, again, somewhat uh, uncertain about what he would be like. But, but fortunately, as I began speaking with him, it wasn't an interrogation, but I, I did get a chance to uh, interview him at, at considerable length. 
And as I began speaking to him, I found him refreshingly uh, open and engaging um, and candid. And I asked him uh, some trick questions, um, mainly because I just wanted to see uh, how much credibility I could attach to him. Again, I, I've known other uh, former KGB officers whose credibility is almost nil. So um, in Alexander's case, I asked him some questions th uh, that fortunately uh, he passed with flying colors. In each case, he o I acknowledged to me uh, what he knew and what he didn't know. And um, again, I, I found that extremely reassuring. Uh, in in Looking at the notebooks as well, one of the valuable things about them, and again, this was in part because, as Alexander mentioned, he wasn't an expert in the history of, of espionage. So he erred on the side of writing down too much uh, and, and would often transcribe things at much greater length than some other people um, would who would, would have known more and would have relied on shorthand more. So he was able, he fortunately for us, he took down a lot and in addition also noted the archival locations of these. Having worked a lot in the uh, Russian archives myself, um, I know that as you go along it becomes very tedious to mark down what the archival locations are. You, you do it because it, uh, because otherwise you can't refer people to it. But um, in Alexander's case in particular, just given the volume of material he was looking at, uh, it must have been extremely laborious, but fortunately it's all there. You can see that in the notebooks. The notebooks um, clearly are going to be difficult for a lot of people to work with, especially those who don't know Russian. But, but the TypeScript, uh, again, I checked this, the TypeScript against the original notebooks and, and again, was extremely reassured. Because before we proceeded with a special issue of the Journal of Cold War Studies that would draw on these notebooks, I wanted to be absolutely sure that, uh, that I would have a very high um, level of confidence in, in their reliability. And by the end of that workshop, and then as I further went through the notebooks and so forth, I did have that high level of confidence. So let me say the, uh, the presentations tomorrow will be articles that are appearing in the summer 2009 issue of the Journal of Cold War Studies. Initially, I was hoping that that issue would be out in time for this conference. It would be out a little early but it's going to be out in a couple of weeks. So it, it will be available soon, but it's not. A uh, table of contents for the issue will be available outside um, shortly thereafter, and will give you a very good sense of what's appearing. But it's essentially the presentations tomorrow, of the article authors, with the uh, introduction by um, John and, and Harvey. and. Um, in my editor's note, I go through uh, some of my sentiments about the reliability of the, uh, of the materials, the provenance of them, and so forth. I also look at these as compared to other sources that have been available in the past, the, um, the Venona materials, the uh, Vasily Mitrokhin's uh, transcriptions of documents from the um, SVR archive and so forth. And uh, I look at how these fit into that. And so let me just say a couple of quick words about that. Is in addition to what Harvey has already uh, quite, quite uh, comprehensively mentioned about the contribution of these notebooks to the history of espionage, uh, uh, espionage in the United States. There are very interesting materials which aren't really used in, in spies because it wasn't the purpose of the book. But there are some very interesting materials that bear on Soviet foreign policy. And I know that, for example, um, several historians here, several scholars here, will find these extremely useful to go through for that purpose. Let me, let me give a quick example is that 
in, in the 1930s, as World War II was approaching, Stalin was receiving a huge volume of intelligence about the intentions of both Germany and Japan. Uh, one of the documents, and again, I, it just, um, I came across it on the first day as I was going through the notebooks and I think asked Alexander about it, it um, fills in something that I think uh, has changed my view of Stalin's efforts to achieve uh, a, a pact of neutrality with Japan. This is a document from 1935 that shows that the Soviet Foreign Intelligence Service was reporting to Stalin that the United States was conniving with Japan to prepare an attack on the Soviet Union. Um, that, that assertion, of course, is untrue. Uh, the United States obviously wasn't. Um, it has no bearing on U.S. intentions at the time. But the fact that such documents were being sent to political leaders, to, to Stalin, to Molotov, others, um, d does help us understand why Stalin, a few years later, was so anxious to sign a non-aggression uh, pact with Japan and therefore, thereby avoid having to fight a two-front war. So seeing those sorts of intelligence documents, correlating them with other documents from the Russian Foreign Ministry archive, from the Russian Commu uh, former Communist Party archives and so forth, enables researchers to discern Stalin's calculations with greater certainty. Um, let me say finally, with regard to the uh, issue of the Journal of Cold War Studies, um, this, the contributors for this were selected quite carefully. People, um, I, most of them actually took part in that April 2006 workshop. Uh, and they were allowed uh, to, to deal with a, a topic of their choosing, but one that we wanted to ensure that the issue would be carefully focused. So tomorrow, in looking at the question of, of Soviet espionage in the United mm -hmm. States, they'll be picking up on some of the topics that Harvey mentioned, but we also want to have, uh, we also, in putting together the issue, wanted to have a more rounded discussion as well. And that's why there are, there are a couple of articles that uh, won't be appearing in the special issue, but that will be appearing in the fall 2009 issue, in particular Stan Norris's paper that will be presented tomorrow and so forth. So as I say, the table of contents will be available outside and anyone um, is, willing, is uh, welcome to pick it up. Okay, thank you, Mark. Before uh, turning over to Catherine, I have to say um, I've never knowingly uh, been the uh, victim of one of Mark Kramer's oral examinations, uh, although um, knowing him, it's possible that I was and didn't even know it because he was so subtle. But, but a, as a former editor of the Cold War Bullet Project Bulletin, uh, I know that not all transcribers from Russian notes or translators of Russians have passed Mark's exam, so I at least am somewhat <laughs> reassured to, to know that uh, in this case uh, his standards have been met. Okay, Catherine? Thank you. Good afternoon. If I can make it big, I will. Is there a way to, oh, here it is, sorry. There. Um, I'm gonna confine my comments today to um, the third presenter, which is uh, Dr. Clare on the issue of the findings that are in these um, materials. As D.D. Guttenplan's recent review of spies in The Nation observed, the 1930s offered a chance for activism by, quote, unabashed radicals who realized that the machinery of the state was available for what seemed like revolutionary ends and proceeded to use it. Why? Even abashed, nervous radicals recognized this. However, rather than work for fixing problems in America as these interracial debaters did, did you ever see, thought, think you'd see A. Philip Randolph and Emma Goldman's boyfriend on the same panel? Um, men and women like Lawrence Duggan, Abraham Glasser, Martha Dodd, and Alger Hiss were most eager to use their access for helping comrades in the Soviet Union in the process of pursuing that state's revolutionary ends. Soon, ironically, the Soviet state was turning counter-revolutionary. By 1937, it was busily cutting off its own limbs in a wrecking enterprise that sent Soviet intelligence agents in America and around the world, mostly decent men, carrying out the bidding of a flawed state um, to the gulag, their deaths, or both, flummoxing many of its loyal American acolytes. 
And when Stalin actually experienced real counter-revolutionary agents bent on his destruction in 1941 to rebuild their own espionage efforts, the Soviets had no choice but to rely on those unpredictable radicals, uh, as Harvey has mentioned already, bashful or no, who'd stuck with them through the dark years of Pactum, people like Ruth Julius Rosenberg, a rock indeed, but also the more mercurial communist Elizabeth Bentley, whose later betrayal helped to gut the entire enterprise. We now know so much more about this work of the 1930s and 1940s thanks to the transcriptions of intelligence agent and journalist Alexander Vasiliev, whose notebooks and the works they have inspired give us a much fuller picture of Soviet espionage than we've ever had before. Not only do the notebooks give a nail in the coffin confirmation that certain controversial figures spied, his for instance, but they convincingly show that they spied longer than we had realized and that there were more of them than we ever knew. Russ McNutt, Boris Podolsky, Nathan Sussman, as you've already mentioned, in the atomic and aviation worlds to name three of the discoveries. We learned, too, that other less-known spies like Ludwig Lorry and David Salmon spied for the money. Soviet spies of this era were thus not only driven by their radicalism, a la Julius and Ethel, um, but now also by other uh, considerations. We also have a fuller understanding of J. Robert Oppenheimer's relationship to the Communist Party, which never included espionage. The authors are good writers as well. They make their characters come to life. Lawrence Duggan's demons, Elizabeth Bentley's loneliness, William Wiesband's arrogance, Nathan Gregory the madman, Silvermaster's passions of many kinds. The hesitations of spy Lawrence Duggan, chief of the State Department's Division of American Republics, this is not that office, but a close approximation perhaps, are an example of this rich biographical detail and help underline the importance of these new materials in the notebooks. Hearing of the heads rolling at the top of the Red Army in early July 1937, Duggan was quite logically alarmed, worried that his materials had been going into the hands of traitors, men who would now expose him. How could he now trust the Soviet government? allowing such treasonous people into its ranks. What an incomprehensible nightmare it all seemed. Reassured by his handler, Norman Barden, that the bad hats were gone, Duggan grudgingly agreed to continue, quote, palpably ambivalent. But he is soon burned all the same, if not by those phantom crooks in the gulag. In October 1939, he was confronted by the evidence of Whitaker Chambers, a true defector, whose testimony to Adolf A. Burley, Assistant Secretary of State in charge of security, revealed Duggan's work for the Soviet Union. Burley told his, Harvard, his fellow Harvard alum to please find another job, but Sumner Wells, Duggan's old mentor, intervened and Duggan stayed on. Still, the quality of his output declined on the topic of American military sales abroad. Duggan continued to require much hand-holding, six-hour meetings, as we learn in the notebooks, to settle him down. His angst did not go away, either. In November 1940, while Duggan consoled himself that the FBI were, quote, like children lost in the woods, he nonetheless continued to worry that all the phones in Washington are tapped. Duggan's anxieties illuminate a struggling U.S. KGB station in the dark days of the Nazi-Soviet Pact era as it tried to hang on to its spooked American contacts while many other countrymen jumped ship and its own intelligence staffs were gutted. As Duggan's worries illustrate, the notebooks also give us a fuller picture of American... American counterintelligence from the perspective of its Soviet targets, a subject that is already drawing diverse reactions among the panelists at this conference. Haynes, Claire, and Vasiliev suggest in spies that the FBI did not, quote, turn its full attention to the Soviet intelligence threat until the mid-1940s, and that American, quote, incompetence and indifference were responsible for so many spies getting away with it and uh, in part two because the FBI devoted scant resources to counterintelligence. Stephen Usdin goes further and calls the government's response to Soviet agents an immense failure embodied in the Rosenberg case. Yet as Haynes and Claire's article, which, will, uh, which uh, you'll see in the journal upcoming, suggests, the notebooks also highlight the KGB's own failures in the face of an American response. They note, for instance, that the FBI's initiatives required the KGB to recruit Judith Coughlin to redress them in 1945. And Usdin himself points out that the notebooks show the U.S. surveillance made the KGB jittery, which uh, for this reason perhaps makes it even more appropriate that Harry Gold produced a jello box um, at his meeting in Los Alamos, a jiggly thing indeed. John Fox goes further, showing an increasingly effective response to Soviet inroads as a consequence of the evolution of American counterintelligence practices during the war. We'll hear more from him tomorrow. Fox concedes that the Bureau's successes were often accidental and short-lived, and indeed the FBI did miss much, a consequence of limited staff and a low priority given to Soviet espionage in the White House. Thus, Harry Gold, the Rosenbergs and Greenglasses, Morton Sobel, Max Elitcher, and the newly named Russell McNutt all eluded discovery during the war. So did Ted Hall, Max Seville, and of course Klaus Fuchs, all while the FBI and military intelligence obsessed about J. Robert Oppenheimer. And William Pearl, Alfred Sarant, and Joel Barr went on their merry way as well, the latter to the strains of 
Messian, hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, some record of intelligence gathering, not, but not so fast. Julius Rosenberg was shut down, we learned here. His party membership raised red flags for the hut, who told army officials to pull him from, no, that's not him, from his position in the Signal Corps when his card carrying came to light in late 1944, despite his earlier denials. He easily got another job, engineers were in high demand during wartime, from whence he stole the large fuse for Feklasov's Hanukkah present. All the same, Soviet intelligence worried that he was now on the FBI's radar, thus putting in danger any intelligence work he might undertake. The competitors, FBI, could have in their possession other incriminating information about him, uh, they fretted. So the KGB deactivated Rosenberg in March 1945 and reorganized his network. This was over hasty. The FBI had no notion of his espionage. Indeed, disregarding the clues that Elizabeth Bentley gave the Bureau later that year about him and his whereabouts, agents did not storm the peaceful halls of Knickerbocker Village until the Fuchs case broke in 1950. Even if Rosenberg's involuntary hiatus in intelligence gathering did not stop him from getting another job in a sensitive post or return to espionage later, his being put on ice surely indicates that American counterintelligence was not completely incompetent in hampering the progress of Soviet agents in the United States during World War II. And the notebook suggests that this was no isolated incident. As Fox's article contends, the FBI was headed in the direction of greater clarity and a more complex approach about its Soviet opponent, and this despite a miserably short staff and in the face of a lack of sympathetic interest interest or even hostility from Washington bureaucracies. In the notebooks, there are numerous examples of counterintelligence efficacy. In the case of spies who were watched and tricked without KGB knowledge, as in Andrei Shevchenko, spies who worried about FBI monitoring even when it was not present, thus implying the Bureau's influence, if nothing else, e.g. Duncan Lee, and most importantly, spies were in situations that the KGB determined were risky to exposure or even failure, and thus called for temporary or permanent severing of contact with them, for example, Abraham Glasser. Taking a look at the characters I'm most attracted to, the chemists and engineers of the and scientists of the XY line, we can see this. Chapter six includes sections on 12 groups and individuals. I won't name them all here for the interest of time, but you might remember Good Vibrations, Blerio, Thomas Black, etc. All this dozen groups uh, mentioned in this chapter, fully half, including Rosenberg's group, Malasoff sources, Blerio, Shevchenko, William Stapler, and Armin Labus Feldman, they were all delimited, deactivi deactivated, or otherwise distressed by FBI efforts. Bungling and competent, the gumshoes and G-men may have been in catching spies, but this record is no failure. If half the industrial and technical spy groups were compromised, delayed, or otherwise diverted from their goals, this was significant for American security in a porous period. And when the atomic spies and those who service them were added in, characters like Steve Nelson, Clarence Hiskey, Arthur Adams, Semyon Semyonov, Joseph Woodrow Weinberg, you know the names, I think, um, Gregory Heifetz, Salman Franklin, Vasily Zerubin, sorry, terrible photo. Um, these men were all monitored, muted, or otherwise reassigned Weinberg, Lomonitz, and Baum off the Manhattan Project, Heifetz and Semyonov back to Russia, Hiskey to the Yukon. This group of 10, added to the 20-odd identified in the XY line chapter, makes a total of at least 30 spies whose industrial and atomic work would have otherwise gone further to assist the Soviet cause if the FBI had been more somnolent or the KGB less sensitive to its powers. Indeed, beginning with the arrest of Gayek Ovakimian in 1941 to the successful sting operation of Andrei Shevchenko in 1944, American counterintelligence had not such a bad record in catching spies, even if the American legal system, as John Earl Haynes and Harvey Clare point out elsewhere, made it almost impossible to prosecute them successfully. During the Nazi-Soviet pact, the staff leadership slashed by the purges, KGB officers of the American station reported that spy mania, a defense boom occasioned by the national emergency of 1939 following the outbreak of war in Europe, and the efforts of the anti-subversives on the Dyes Committee and the concomitant spread of American patriotism had all made it difficult to get their jobs done. Once the war began, a warming trend in Soviet-American relations created many opportunities for increased espionage, not surprisingly, as well as legal technology transfer through Lend-Lease, Many of these formerly abashed supporters of communism could now embrace the Soviet leadership once again in fighting fascism, working for the Soviets in war industry and government agencies like the OSS, as the notework notebooks show. Nevertheless, American counterintelligence strength expanded at the same time and not just against the Germans and Japanese. During the war, spies were caught and foiled by double agents, Soviet representatives were harassed and driven home, and the radicals of the 1930s, like Elizabeth Bentley, quote, an ardent, unidealistic communist who saw something very wrong in America during the Depression, now saw herself as we've heard, abandoned by her former family and was driven to the FBI. Her, as it turned out then, as the notebooks indicate, her defection was perhaps the worst thing that ever happened to Soviet intelligence, at least until John Walker's ex-wife put down her cocktail glass and picked up the phone. 
To conclude then, the notebooks are full of surprises. There are more spies here than we knew of. Those we knew about were doing more than we ever knew, but we learned something else. Despite working for an oppressive, obsessive, not to mention racist autocrat, J. Edgar Hoover's staff and others in the counterintelligence community uh, to, and uh, were more effective than we've typically given them credit for. And meanwhile, their foes, idealists as they may have been, by arrogating so much of American foreign policy to themselves, as Austin notes, helped sow the seeds for a, quote, spy mania like none they'd ever imagined, orchestrated by a numerically challenged anti-communist who even went too far for Hoover. And as the notebooks show, the Soviets knew by 1950 that their agents, the Rosenbergs, the Green Glasses, were in big trouble if they did not fly like the wind and get to the border with Mexico. And even if they were there, there were no guarantees. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I I'm actually listed as a commentator, but I'm going to be extremely brief so we can move to the discussion as quickly as possible. Um, I, I just want to raise a couple of questions for the co-authors about the parameters of the material, since this is our, our, our panel for that purpose. You know, the uh, title uh, of the uh, <coughs> session in includes it that uh, this is Notebooks and Documentation of Soviet Intelligence Operations in the United States, 1930 to 1950. I, is there such a arbitrary cutoff? Uh, the materials do not then extend beyond 1950 in the Cold War. For that, we must turn to uh, the, the future Mitrokin notebooks. Or are there materials that go beyond that? Similarly, most of the material at first glance seems to be focused on internal secrets in the U.S. Uh, is there also much material on U.S. foreign policy operations, uh, extensions beyond the U.S., or that would be separate? Are there additional materials that have not yet been translated and incorporated into the collection? Um, also, just to foreshadow what I'm sure will come up in the debate, we're dealing with, in many cases, very sensitive uh, personal reputations and, and uh, stories. And one issue that has repeatedly come up with former communist uh, intelligence archives um, is it always clear in these operational files, um, obviously when someone is getting a regular payment and signing a contract, is it always clear when a source is witting, when an agent is witting, um, are there clear markers to determine, uh, to guard against the danger of uh, agents inflating uh, their sources, inflating uh, the significance of the material? Also, you, you very quickly ran down some of the key findings. In my quick glancing at, at the book the, this morning, I, a couple of names jumped out for what was not there, and I just wanted to raise a couple to see if that's um, a, an, an omission of evidence that you found or evidence of omission, that they really were not agents. Um, just like you uh, write, in fact, that the case is now closed on J. Robert Oppenheimer's alleged espionage, though we, 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 um, we don't know if uh, William Borden was an agent, but that's, that's rather later in the story. Um, uh, I could not find in the three references uh, in the index any uh, indication that Harry Hopkins was anything other than a loyal official. Uh, similarly, during the pseudopod of charges, uh, at one point the name of Niels Bohr was mentioned and hotly disputed, and Bohr's name does not appear in the index. So I presume that also indicates that, as with Fermi and Zillard and Oppenheimer, no evidence was found to cast doubt on his uh, reputation. Um, I also just quickly noted that there was uh, no index reference for Winston Churchill, which seemed to indicate, given the intensity of Soviet interest on American war aims, that uh, there was not much effective penetration uh, at the top levels of either the White House or the U.S. foreign policy apparatus um, during the war, as opposed to the earlier period um, that you mentioned. So th those are just some very quick reactions. And since they're not topics of specific panels for tomorrow, I thought I would bring them up. Um, why don't we start opening the floor, unless you'd like to make any, any quick responses to what any of the commentators have said. Um, John, go ahead. Well, uh, let me uh, refer to a couple of the questions you raised. Uh, there is some post-50s material, particularly uh, dealing with Klaus Fuchs, uh, mm -hmm. uh, because Alexander did have access to Fuchs's uh, material. And uh, that material goes into KGB relationships with him after he got out of prison and his move to Germany, uh, East Germany, uh, and a visit to the Soviet Union. And so that goes into the mid-1960s. But that's one of the few exceptions. Otherwise, it really is 30s, uh, 40s, and, and, uh, and 1950, uh, and not much else. Uh, no, there is no additional material. There's, there are no untranslated notebooks, um, unless Alexander uh, has, uh, has mentioned it to us. As far <laughs> no. as we know, that's it. No. Um, 
Uh, no, uh, there's uh, there's nothing about any any uh, contact with Hopkins or or Bohr. Um, mm -hmm. uh, as for clear markers about who and who isn't an uh, agent, um, you know, if you take one particular page, things may not be clear. When you go through a thousand pages of this stuff, things become very clear uh, as to when they're talking about someone who is a knowing source and someone who is providing information in a legal above board fashion. In fact, often the, the uh, officer will re report that I, I learned X uh, from Y in line of cover, meaning not as, a, not as an agent, but in my cover position, uh, which is a perfectly benign and straightforward uh, position. Uh, Harvey? You yeah, uh, one other uh, example of, of post-1950 material, uh, Stanley Grays, whom I mentioned in my talk, um, uh, who was in exile in Costa Rica. Um, there's actually, Alexander copied a, a report from uh, the early 1970s uh, when Grays came back into the, the KGB's field of vision. Um, there's a report written by a, an officer from who's stationed in Costa Rica who says, I was at a wedding uh, last weekend, and there was this American there named Stanley Grays who said he used to work for us. Um, <laughs> And, and he said, uh, you know, I, I, was told, I was told at one time that I was a colonel. Perhaps I'm a general by now. And, <laughs> um, and, and Grace was, uh, you know, Grace, Grace talked about how he was so delighted to meet a Russian after so many years. And, and uh, uh, so the, the, that is a post-50s uh, uh, example. Uh, another question about, about the, the sources being witting or not. Uh, there, there are numerous e examples in the notebooks where uh, a KGB officer is, is reporting on, on a meeting with a source and, and says, um, you know, so-and-so uh, so -and -so is not clear exactly who he or she works for, um, or so-and-so thinks that this information is going to Earl Browder. Uh, and then you'll find uh, in another report about the same person uh, the comment that, um, you know, he, he's, he, he says he's not sure about who he's working for, but he really knows. Um, or in another case uh, that I recall, um, uh, I believe this was Harry Dexter White. Um, I could be wrong on this one. Uh, the, the, the report notes that uh, White, of course, is clear about where his information goes. Um, so the, the, in some cases, there's contradictory information about whether the person is witting or not. Uh, in other cases, it's clear that the person has willingly suspended disbelief uh, or doesn't want to know. Hey, can, I, can I say Please. Yeah. Uh, I would like to comment on several questions. First on um, whether they worked willingly or unwillingly. Uh, so sometimes they, uh, there were cases when uh, they thought they were working for uh, Comintern, not for the NKVD, like in the case of Martha Dodd. Initially, there is a document or a couple of documents saying that she thinks she's working for Comintern. When she arrived in Moscow in, uh, I think, about 1935 or 1936 to ask Stalin to, to allow them to marry, uh, to for her to her and uh, her Russian lover, uh, Boris Vinogradov, who was also her recruiter and handler. So she arrived in Moscow to ask Stalin to, for permission to get married. Uh, she was introduced, and she wrote a, a memo to him. She was introduced uh, to, uh, to a person who presented himself as Manuijski. That was, Manuijski was one of, of the executive of, of the Comintern, as far as I remember. But that was one of the representatives, representatives of the NKVD. So that this was uh, one of the cases. Uh, for instance, in the case of Silvermaster, he was initially handled by uh, Elizabeth Bentley, then by Itzhak Akhmerov, um, illegal station chief in New York who used to travel to Washington. Akhmerov presented himself to his um, sources as a member of the American Communist Party. And several times he wrote to the Moscow Center that um, Silver Master, Silver Master didn't respect him much for this because he didn't want to work for the commu for American Communist Party. But <laughs> Akhmerov could <laughs> had no choice. He, that was, uh, well, he couldn't say to him that he was a Soviet citizen and Soviet officer. 
So when um, Akhmerov present well uh, organized a meeting between Silvermaster and uh, I think it was Pravdin. Pravdin uh, was uh, an NKVD officer working in New York. Silvermaster obviously was actually said that he was happy finally to meet a Soviet citizen <laughs> after working for several years with Akhmerov. Um, so there were different cases. Uh, someone got scared when they, uh, I think it was uh, uh, the case with um, Duncan Lee, who got scared when he realized that he was working for the Soviet Union. Others like Silvermaster, they, on the contrary, they were glad, glad to work for the Soviet Union. Um, now about uh, Harry Hopkins. Uh, I, I remember it was, this story was in, uh, I think, in, in the book by Christo Christopher Andrew and Oleg Gordievsky about the KGB, and it was translated in, in Russia in early 1990s, and uh, I, I read it. Um, oh, frankly, with all, with all my respect to Christopher Andrew, uh, that story seemed to me quite suspicious, because uh, Gordievsky said that Akhmerov gave a lecture to KGB officers during which he said that uh, Harry Hopkins uh, was a Soviet agent. You know, I worked in uh, 1980s in the US department and uh, the secrecy was extremely tight. I mean, we were sitting three of us in one room. Uh, we had no right to know the material our colleagues were working with. We couldn't ask about it. Uh, Akhmerov worked in the NKVD in the times of Stalin and Beria. I don't really think that uh, the security rules under Stalin and Beria were you know, weaker than in the 1980s. So I, I don't think it was possible for Akhmerov to tell this story about uh, Harry Hopkins being a Soviet agent to a group at a lecture to a group of KGB officers. And when I was working, wi uh, was doing uh, the research, uh, I never saw his name as an agent. I don't think he even have a cover, had a cover name. But. Uh, he, he's, I, he's mentioned um, very few times and um, in uh, all of the summarizing documents which summarized the results of the work in the United States, uh, he wasn't there. So I don't think he was an agent. But this is my you know, opinion. Ed Mark uh, Okay, uh, let's open the floor. Let me no, just... No, I, mean, I, I, I was also... I wanted to, to, to answer one of your questions. Uh, okay, so just very quickly. Uh, no, we're good. Um, about exaggerating, when uh, you said uh, well if the officer could exaggerate the, the importance of his source of, uh, let's say, of, uh, of an agent in, uh, in America. Well, this is a good, it looks very beautiful in, uh, in the novel Our Man in Havana by <laughs> Graham Greene, <laughs> right? <laughs> Perhaps the British sec uh, Secret Service worked this way. I don't think NKVD and KGB did. I don't think it's possible for several reasons. First of all, <coughs> if there is a continuous flow of, of information from, from an agent, it will have to be verified by other sources or by the events, subsequent events. If it, doesn't, is, if it is not confirmed several times by the subsequent event, events, uh, there is a suspicion that uh, the agent is lying or the operative is lying. It's one thing. Second thing, if you have, if you are handling a good agent for for a considerable period of time, uh, the, your boss, uh, your station chief, will want to meet with him. And if <laughs> if you lie to the station chief, you are in big trouble. <laughs> and thirdly, um, the average term of a mission of a of an intelligence officer abroad is three to four years. 
After that, he is supposed to pass his contact to another officer. So in this case, if there is no agent or there is a person who doesn't, who has no idea who he was working for, you are in big trouble again. So this is Okay, uh, we'll start opening things up now. Uh, let me just make a couple of rules. Please wait for the microphone and please also identify yourself and uh, your affiliation or relevance to this story. And please try to keep comments or questions brief because we have such a crowded uh, floor. And start with Ed Mark and then we'll, we'll move around. With or without the microphone, thank you. I'd, I'd simply like to say that the, the allegation that Harry Hopkins was a spy is the, is the most disreputable of all the many myths about espionage in the, in the Cold War. And it flies completely in the face of the man's record. In 1941, for example, when communists were striking in defense plants because of Stalin's alliance with Hitler, Harry Hopkins seriously proposed to Roosevelt that the entire membership of the Communist Party be locked up. And at several points in the war, notably the case of the Tolstoy Conference in 1944, uh, Hopkins intervened to stiffen Roosevelt's spine. Uh, I, I won't go into all the details here, but it's, it's simply, I just want to say that this is indignation that this oh, is Ed, silly. you're, you're just reinfor reinforcing the, the point of the question. Um, it, was that your only comment? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Amy Knight? Thank you. Amy Knight, author of uh, several books on the KGB and uh, most recently a book on the defector Kuzenko. I was just struck um, by, a, I, I gather the purpose today partly was to talk about sort of the specifics of the, of the origins of the notebook. So these are technical issues, actually. Uh, very briefly, um, uh, Mr. Vasiliev says in his book, in 1995, I started writing draft chapters for the Haunted Wood on the basis of the material I had collected in my notebooks. Um, and then you said again today, I wrote, I wrote my chapters at home. Actually, your testimony to the High Court in London for the libel trial in 2003 which is available on tapes. There isn't a transcript. There are tapes that are available. Um, that's rather different, and that, that does, um, perhaps you can explain. When you were asked very specifically more than once, um, you said that you did not write your chapters on the basis of the notebooks, but that you wrote them while you were in the, uh, having access to the documents. You said you wrote them on the basis of the documents in the press room. So. You know, perhaps there's just a confusion about the question that was asked, but you did say that. I, I was rather surprised because you said it more than once when asked by, uh, by the court. And then the other thing that I'm curious about is this matter of DHL. Um, you, you said, in, again, in the introduction, I decided not to take my notebooks with me because I was afraid I would be searched at the airport and the notebooks would be seized. Mm -hmm. Actually, at the trial, you even suggested that you might be in trouble yourself and suffer some sort of legal consequences for taking out these materials that were secret and declassified and hadn't been declassified. So I'm curious as to why in 2001, when the situation actually with Putin in power was much more uh, uh, dangerous and the, uh, the things were a lot stricter than they were in 1996, I'm w wondering um, why DHL, which requires, I've shipped things DHL, you have to fill out uh, reports and everything else. I, I'm not quite sure I understand why that guaranteed that your um, notebooks would arrive safely. And also, what well you said in the trial, you had a family member send them by DHL. Wouldn't that person be exposing themselves to the possibility of some legal sanctions if, in fact, they at Customs did seize these materials? I mean, whoever sends them has to write it down. So I'm not quite sure I understand why, why you didn't, uh, you know, why DHL would somehow ensure that these documents would be safe. Well, it, it, it didn't. I mean, uh, I had to take this risk and it worked, that's all. Uh, I, can, I can't identify the person who sent them to me for obvious reasons. He's still, st he's still in Moscow, so I, I don't really want to talk about it. Now, about your first question. Um, uh, the trials were uh, six years ago, right, T 2003. I, of course, I, I wrote, I wrote uh, 
the chapters based both on the notebooks, which actually had transcriptions from the documents. So when I say I worked with the documents, I, I mean both the real documents in the files which I was receiving at the same time and the, my transcriptions in the notebooks. That's what I mean. Oh, because you did, to be fair, you did say to the, to, to the court more than <laughs> once, no, I did not write them on the basis no, of the look, notebooks. I, I can't, I, <laughs> I don't really want to discuss it because uh, we, we have to, to, if you could show me the text and the circumstances, then. Okay. Actually, let me just add one little follow-up question. You, you mentioned several times that um, the draft chapters that you sent to Alan Weinstein had yeah. to be reviewed. C can you comment um, before you could send them? to be declassified, <laughs> uh, w were many materials uh, censored from the materials that you contributed for that book? No, uh, um, I sent uh, my, my chapters to Alan after I, uh, uh, let me think now, because <laughs> that was, yeah, let me start with, th with this. Several, several chapters were released by the Declassification Commission uh, those were chapters about uh, Elizabeth Bentley and uh, uh, Jacob Golos, about the cooperation between the NKVD and the Office of Strategic Services. Uh, I think the, they released, ah, they released a chapter about Samuel Dickstein, which was very good, and um, I had to wait for it because uh, the, mo the mo most important principle, well, when the commission was uh, was created, uh, Mr. Primakov, the uh, head of the Russian intelligence service, told the members of the, of the commission that they should look at my material from one point of view, whether it um, wh whether the releasing of this material would uh, damage somehow the current operations of the KG of the Russian intelligence service in uh, abroad. So. And another thing which uh, was w very important for, uh, for the Russian intelligence service was uh, whether this or that uh, person um, admitted themselves they were spying for the Soviet Union. Samuel Dickstein never did. That's why I, I was pleasantly surprised that uh, the chapter was released. Maybe because uh, I didn't really want to discuss it because I, I was afraid they will change their minds. But uh, maybe because it was uh, really fascinating stuff and uh, we just wanted to have it published. Uh, I, I, didn't, I actually fin haven't finished. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, I sent um, the translations of my chapters, I translated them into English and sent them uh, to Alan only after I moved to London in 1996. That's why uh, your question about the year 2001 is, is not really relevant. I was living in, in London, and I, ha I received permanent residence. And since 1996, I haven't been, uh, I, I have never been back to Moscow. Okay, uh, Ray Gartoff, I think you had your hand up. Uh, can you pass the microphone to Ray? <coughs> is the microphone on, Jim? I think so, yes. Is this on? Okay. Yes. Um, uh, Raymond Garthoff, uh, multiply retired. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask whether you had anything in the materials relating to tasking uh, by uh, Soviet intelligence of uh, agents in America or concerning America um, for um, either successful or unsuccessful uh, attempts to acquire American nuclear war planning in 1945 to 1950 period. Um, as you know, a number of these plans were uh, declassified and released in the uh, latter 1970s, and a lot's been said about them since. Uh, but um, um, at least two retired uh, senior uh, KGB generals uh, uh, said that uh, uh, these um, plans were all obtained. Uh, one says in a timely way, and another said uh, that, uh, of course, everything was obtained. Neither of these seemed very uh, credible, but that's uh, 
uh, beside the point. Um, another source uh, uh, indicated another that um, efforts were being made, but had not at that point succeeded uh, in the 19. Uh, 50 to 55 period to obtain drop shot, the best known of these war plans. Um, is there anything that you have in this material which bears uh, on either successful or unsuccessful attempts uh, to acquire uh, such plans? John? Harvey? No, I no, I don't think we I, don't, I can't no. remember anything. No. Um, now, uh, Alexander, you know, does mention that, that um, his access to material on atomic espionage was was sort of cut off. Yeah, uh, uh, the second uh, it's, yeah. Um, you know, uh, the, the nuclear espionage, the file on the nuclear espionage is called Enormous, and I had access only to uh, the first volume of it, which I don't remember when <laughs> it stopped. I think it, it stopped somewhere in 19, in, in, late f in, in the late 40s. I never seen anything about these uh, nuclear war, war plans. I could s say that <coughs> I've never seen an indication before 19, 1950 or 1951, never seen an indication that the Soviet Union considered the United States as their main adversary. I've seen a list of main adversaries. Uh, Alek Tsarev showed it to me for 1930s first one before 1933. First one was Britain, as far as I remember, then France, then Poland, then the Baltic States. After 1933, it was, oh, of course, Germany. Mm -hmm. The first mention of America as uh, the main adversary appears in a document by Savchenko, which was written in 1950 or 1951. It's in the Haunted Wood. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time I saw the uh, uh, this uh, formula, main adversary. Mm. Jim, just just okay. a, a yes. brief comment. Uh, there is a section of the book dealing with the, the state of, of KGB operations in the U.S. after 1945. Uh, so much was uh, shut down in the wake of the Bentley defection and Guzinko that, uh, frankly, uh, and, and uh, all of the information there indicates they really were down to <laughs> almost no good sources. And I would be highly surprised if they had access to something like that. Okay. Um, uh, let's turn it over here. But uh, first, let me read a, a couple of questions from the overflow crowd. And uh, I think these can be f uh, fairly quickly dealt with. First, uh, when and where will the Vasiliev papers appear on the Library of Congress website? So far, only on Wilson Center website, John? Uh, well, the, the Library of Congress doesn't have any current plans to put them on the web. I mean, the, physically, uh, they were delivered to the library. They're available for research to those, you, those of you who want to actually look at the real hard copy paper in the manuscript reading room of the Library of Congress. Okay, uh, another question addressed to you. Was physicist Podolsky uh, the same Podolsky who co-authored the famous paper with Einstein and uh, Rosen? Yes, he was. Okay. And uh, this is a kind of broad one that might be past the purview of this. How does Soviet espionage activity in the U.S. until 1945 compare with other European espionage networks here during the same period? Uh, uh, that's I kind of know. a, that's a, <laughs> no, that's a rather broad question. No, no, no. Okay. That's beyond my pay grade. Okay. Over here? <laughs> Microphone over here? Microphone. I write for The Nation, and I'm the author of a biography of I.F. Stone, which is out now in your bookstores. Um, I have a couple of factual questions for Alexander Vasiliev, and then a couple of, but they're all very short questions. And, and keep in mind, we'll get much more deeply into the Stone case yeah, tomorrow. Not, none of these are about Stone. These okay, are fine. about the, the larger project. Uh, one is a very technical question, which is, can you hear me, everybody? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is um, how the personal files were indexed. Were they indexed by code name or by real name? Cover name. Cover name. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second is, um, I w would be interested to hear about uh, your views on the continuum. We can talk about this more tomorrow, but from agent to, from source to agent to witting agent to spy. Uh, because you said today Hemingway was not an agent, and I thought that was interesting because the chapter title is uh, on Hemingway is Dilettante Spy. And it's sort of hard to be a spy if you're not an agent. Uh, now the questions about you are, uh, as you'll recall, I was there in London in the trial that, uh, that you lost. So one question is, do you still have an outstanding libel judgment against you in the UK? Two is, um, how did you support yourself since losing that, tr that trial in 2003? 
Three is, what was your financial arrangement with the Yale University Press? And four is, what is the role of the Smith Richardson Foundation in funding, it says in the, uh, the introduction to the book that they funded the translation, what is their role in funding either your research, this book, this conference, or not? Those are my what factual was, what questions. Was the, I forgot already the first one. The first, <laughs> <laughs> the first question was uh, continuum from a uh, source agent spy. Right. Because uh, you, said, you said Hemingway was not an agent, and the book says Hemingway dilettante spy. <coughs> no, spy, spy um, uh, professional officers uh, try not to use the words like uh, spy, espionage, um, agent. Uh, they, um, in professional talk, they use euphemisms. Um, you mean Hemingway was not a euphemism? Uh, no, <laughs> no. Look, let, let, let me. Uh, it's it's a, it's a very broad question. I just I'm trying to systematize it in in, in my mind. Uh, let, let me talk first about source and agent. Uh, a person may be sor a source without being an agent. An agent may be an agent without being a source. Uh, I will try to explain this. For instance, let's say uh, there, is, there is an official in the State Department who has uh, access to top secret material and he has a friend who is working for the KGB. This uh, official gives his material to his friend right? without knowing that his friend is uh, let's say his friend told him that he is writing a scientific paper, right? So uh, in this case, the State Department official becomes source without being an agent. Very clear. Now the, 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 the second um, position, uh, agent without, be without being a source. Um, example, Frank, Zel Ze Frank Zellman, who handled Martha Dodd? Zellman Franklin. Yes, uh, Zellman Franklin. Um, he was, uh, he, he handled Martha Dodd and uh, there are very lively reports by him about meeting her. Uh, he was an agent, he was uh, called, he, he can be called agent handler in the professional sure. language, but he wasn't a source because he didn't have top secret information. About the word spy, I don't know, it's a very broad term. It's, it's, never, <laughs> it's never used by, by the KGB. I mean, it's just you know, literature. About the other questions, I don't really, <coughs> so I'm not going to, to, to discuss my financial matters at all. Okay, as far as the so conference goes, um, if Christian, Christian Osterman is here tomorrow, he might want to uh, address the funding for the conference. I, I know the Cold War Project gets funds from a lot of different um, foundations and the like for various activities. I simply don't know that. No, the, the, we'll the, check, we can the, check with The point tomorrow. of my question, um, and I should say, by the way, that I, I found the, the notebooks themselves fascinating reading, and I think people are going to have to read them and deal with them. So, but I think, you know, there are a lot of stories that are fascinating, but we don't know whether they're true or not. So part of the question is, uh, to put it bluntly, and I don't mean to yeah, be no rude problem. about this, the question of your credibility and your motivation. And, you know, if these, if these notebooks are your only asset, and they're only of interest if they say what John and Harvey want them to say, then that's something that people have, have a right to know about. I know you convened this, this other conference in, in 2006 to vet them, but you know, maybe you answered those questions then and maybe you satisfied people, but that's why I asked them, not, uh, not, I, I, not, I, I, not because, uh, not because I'm, I'm meaning uh, to okay, doubt let, let either your scholarship or your faithfulness right. in transcribing so what let you put let me, let, me an response. Go ahead. let me answer that. Um, you know, we made a decision, uh, th th as, we, as we note in the book, the Smith Richardson Foundation provided a grant to enable us to have these documents professionally translated. Um, we thought it was important to have them professionally translated and they were willing to do it. Um, and there was a little bit of money left over from that grant and in part that went to help fund this conference to pay the, for the speakers. The speakers are not getting honoraria or anything like this to pay to fly them to Washington and to put them up. Uh, the other sources for the, this conference are uh, Emory University, where I teach, uh, and Yale University Press, which obviously has an interest in publicizing the book. Um, 
I would add that, that the, the, we made the decision, uh, first of all, Alexander uh, donated the notebooks to the Library of Congress. He did not receive any money for those notebooks. He donated them. Um, and we made the decision to make those notebooks available not only at the Library of Congress but on the web so that people can examine the documentary evidence that we have used in this book. And I anticipate that there will be people that may have come to some different interpretations. Um, you've come to a different interpretation on I have stone. I think you're wrong. Uh, but the fact is that uh, but the fact is that the material is on the web. I would point out that that um, in the case of the Venona material, um, NSA has only released the English language translations. Uh, the Matrokin material, the vast bulk of it, has not been released. Uh, we chose to release this material so people can assess this material. Okay. Uh, let me just make one quick. Okay, quickly. So quickly, if, too, Jim. if we were concerned with the big bucks, we sure wouldn't go to Yale University okay. Press. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, Bart Bernstein, please. Over there. <laughs> Bart Bernstein, Stanford University. Uh, to begin with an oblique preamble, a famous philosopher once remarked the meaning is the use. But you suggested instead, and quite reasonably for historians, the meaning is the interpretation. Let me get some leverage on that by asking you that uh, three co-authors of a book, did you always agree on the meaning slash interpretation? In cases of the interesting disputes you had, how did you resolve them? Are, are some so ambivalent collectively that they're unresolved and not in the book? And another notable case, could you tell us of one resolved that's interesting and how you came about resolving it? Co-authors? Well, one, one disagreement, um, although it, it, I don't think, played a, a role in, in um, well, one disagreement is, Al as Alexander notes in his introduction, he thinks many of these people were heroes. Uh, I think John and I would disagree with that. Um, so we certainly came at this, at least the, the, the two of us and Alexander, from quite different perspectives. Um, John and I have collaborated on, on so many projects over so long a period of time that um, perhaps we, we have lost the ability to disagree. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I really can't think of any major. How about the third co-author? Uh, yeah, Harvey, let, 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 uh, let me make one comment on that. When we first met Alexander and discussed uh, pursuing a book project, uh, one of the questions that uh, came up would, well, what if we disagree? What if Alexander uh, uh, disagrees with how, of course, obviously Harvey and I would be writing the basic text. Uh, what if he really disagreed with something or someone else disagreed? Well, Alexander's position was, well, there are three co-authors. The majority rules. <laughs> and then he said, with the provision that if one co-author really disagrees, they have the right to add an appendix stating their dissent. Now, as it turns out, none of us decided to add a dissent, but that was our agreement. No. No. Uh, can I go? <laughs> no, I, I can tell everything. <laughs> <laughs> they, they tortured me and beat me up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what is that? Are, aren't you a little surprised that the Supreme Court of the United States, looking at the plain meaning of legislation, quote unquote, disagrees so often, but three co-authors, no dissent at all? Uh, well. As, uh, as, as uh, I said in my introduction, uh, we come from different uh, backgrounds. I was uh, born in the Soviet Union, uh, still consider myself a Russian patriot, and uh, if we consider this, uh, well, the issue of espionage may be considered on different, on different levels. On the practical level, it's really about on which side you are. So I'm on the Russian side, so for me, people like LG Heath, Silver Master, Ted Hall, they're heroes. And I made it completely clear to John and Harvey. We had discussions, of course, during uh, the three years of our work, but uh, I made some suggestions, uh, but mostly there were suggestions about adding more stuff. 
about about adding more quotes. I they did most of it, not uh, everything. I, for instance, suggested to put more personal letters between Victor Hammer and his son in Moscow because I, I find them fascinatingly humane and it's a great story, hu just human story. But if they agreed to everything I asked, the book would be you know, 1,000 pages. So I understand that it was impossible. But I had really great ins experience of working with them. Okay, over here. Microphone. Uh. Wes Vernon, columnist for Renew America, also with Accuracy and Media. I'd like to direct a question to Dr. Clare, if I may. Going back to J. Robert Oppenheimer, as I understand the, uh, and I'm speaking strictly from memory here, so correct me if I'm wrong, but if I, under, if I recall correctly, the Atomic Energy Commission found that J. Robert Oppenheimer was a security risk, and therefore he was denied his security clearance. And that, uh, as I also seem to believe, uh, recall that it cost Louis Straws his uh, confirmation in the Senate a few years later to be Secretary of Commerce because it was so controversial. However, uh, none of that uh, erases the fact that he what did have an affinity for the Communist Party. He was believed to be a member. Well, as well, let's not talk about this for very long because we're going to deal with this at length tomorrow. It comes up tomorrow. Okay, but oh, okay, okay. Then l let me just get down to the to the guts of it. If anyone uh, alleges that your failure to find that he actually turned documents physically over to the Soviets discredits the Atomic Energy Commission finding, that would have to be, would it not, either a case of uh, Monday morning quarterbacking at best or at worst misleading? Well, again, as, as, uh, as Jim Hirschberg notes, the, we'll be talking about Oppenheimer tomorrow, and, and I don't want to uh, steal the thunder then, but you know, I, I, I don't think that, that it necessarily implies that. Um, I, I think we make clear in the book that there's considerable evidence, and, uh, and I think Jim, uh, uh, Greg Herkin will be talking about this tomorrow, there's considerable evidence that Oppenheimer was a secret member of the Communist Party and that he had lied about it. Um, and that led him into a, a, a convoluted web of lies that uh, you could argue at least plausibly um, gave the Atomic Energy Commission uh, a rationale for finding that he was a security risk. Um, th they did note that, that, that there was no evidence that he had spied. And um, I indeed, in the chapter th uh, in which we talk about it, I think we, we provide pretty conclusive evidence that he did not. The fact is that the, the KGB was constantly, in Moscow, was constantly complaining, why haven't you recruited Oppenheimer? And, uh, you know, this is a serious flaw. He's a, he's a secret member of Comrade Browder's apparatus and, uh, you know, recruit him. And they were unable to do so, partly because they couldn't get to him because of the security around him. Um, and they, they tried a number of, of different routes to get to him and they failed. Um, so that, you know, I, I think it's quite clear when they, when they talk about atomic espionage, they talk about their sources, Oppenheimer is conspicuously absent. Uh, so I, I think the evidence is overwhelming that Oppenheimer was not a Soviet source. Okay, we'll get back to this subject tomorrow. Uh, Michael Dobbs, over here. M Michael. Yeah. Michael Dobbs, former Washington Post correspondent, uh, often author and reporter in Moscow, too. Um, well, I want to just start, get back to the our man in Havana question, um, which of course was a caricature, but um, in some ways it accurately depicts um, how intelligence agencies sometimes operate. And I'm not as sanguine as Alexander about the professionalism and accuracy in all cases of uh, former KGB agents in their reporting, and you can give various examples about that. Um, just looking at, um, you know, through this, through the book, and just cite one example, um, which is uh, uh, mentioning of uh, uh, of Walter Lippmann as a um, as an agent. Can you give Your a page reference, by the way? Page uh, 151. Thank you. Um, uh, a message from the uh, uh, Moscow Center 
talking about the uh, following agent capabilities need to be put to the most effective use, and it gives various names. Uh, Pancake, which is Eye of Stone, and then Bumblebee, which is um, Walter Lippmann. And the authors acknowledge that Lippmann wasn't a, an agent, but here he is being described as an agent. Um, you can give other examples too, but just because somebody appears uh, mentioned as an agent in the book and in KGB reporting, that doesn't necessarily mean that he is an agent. Um, so, you know, I'm a little skeptical about the, your um, endorsement of all no. KGB reporting. It's, it's not an endorsement. I, I it's, it's rather general feeling. I, I didn't get a feeling that in um, the people who worked in uh, the officers who worked in 1930s, 1940s, in, uh, made up stuff, you know, invented their agents. It's, it was different environment and a different atmosphere. They had agents without inventing them. And uh, if you are working on the technical, on the technical line, <laughs> you can't invent an agent. You need to, to provide drawings and, uh, you mean, I mean, details. You can't do this. Oh, there, could, there, could be, there could be honest mistakes. No one is free from, you know, ev every, everyone can do mistake, can make a mistake. Uh, I would say that maybe later, maybe la I, I, had, I, I don't know concrete examples of it, maybe later in 1980s, when I worked in, in, uh, in the KGB, people would be more willing to do this but not in, 19, in, in, in 30s and 40s. It's just my, my feeling. If you have examples, concrete examples, I would be glad to discuss it, them with you. Uh, just a, a brief comment on Lippmann. Uh, uh, what you quote there is accurate, but he's, lip he's discussed elsewhere in the book, and other KGB documents are cited. These other documents make extremely clear that the KGB officer talking about Lippmann uh, indicated that his uh, conversations with Lippmann were in line of cover. It was a task uh, off, off uh, correspondent who was a KGB officer uh, having a relationship with Lippmann. And, and those documents make very clear that Lippmann had no idea whatsoever he was dealing with a KGB officer. He thought he was dealing with a senior Russian journalist, and he was talking with a fellow journalist. Which, of course, brings up a point that goes back to the Venona documents, that not everyone who had a code name was an agent. Of uh, course not. Yeah, that's right. Right. This, 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 this issue also comes up in Max Holland's article, um, is discussed there, in, in, in precisely the point that you're asking. Okay, over here, please. Absolutely. <coughs> yes, over there, please. Thank you. My name is Don LaSalle, and I work at California State University, Northridge. Uh, I wanted to thank all the, the authors also for making the notebooks available. I was able to use them. I'm finishing manuscript on Anglo-Soviet Intelligence Corporation, and I was looking especially at the white notebook where you had, where it seems you have had access to the personnel documents of Vasily Zarubian and Gaik Ovakimian. And you also mentioned that there was an inspection uh, by Andrei Kraur uh, who was very negative about Ovakimian, and I was surprised in 1939, and I was actually surprised to see that Ovakimian survives until 1941. Um, so I think these documents give an intriguing look also at the um, task of the intelligence officers. I wanted to ask you just basic questions. You seem to have handled these personnel files of officers abroad. What do they look like? What is their color? What is their feel? Um, and I wanted to ask whether they are just as disorganized as the agent's files, or do the center files um, appear to be more organized and systematic? And so I wanted to ask you whether, if you've seen the files of Ovakimian, Zarubin, whether you can um, identify those as being systematic and organized. Thank you. Yeah, all, all the files here are either green or brown. Um, all the files are center files. So were, I don't think there were files in, in the stations. Uh, I, I, I think I've seen uh, personal files on Zarubin and Avakimian. I didn't see a personal file on uh, um, uh, Akhmerov. 
I, I very much would like to, but I didn't. Because uh, the illegal department didn't cooperate with the book project. They said just said no and <laughs> forget about it. <laughs> That's why I didn't get it. Uh, they're very thin, actually. Uh, the personal files, very thin. Uh, the file on Zarubin, which I saw, uh, as far as I remember, doesn't contain a lot of, a lot of information. It contains just um, a list of countries where he used to work before America, and it's an impressive list. It's about 10 countries, and also uh, Elizabeth Zarubina, the same thing. And there is nothing, uh, th there is um, uh, information that he, he, he took part in uh, the shooting of Polish officers in Katyn. There is nothing on this uh, in, the fi in the personal file I saw. But I, s I found on the Russian internet uh, inf uh, some documents about Katyn. And um, according to them, Zarubin was before there before talking to NKVD sources among Polish officers. But he didn't take part in the shooting. He uh, went away. Now, the guy who sent a letter to the FBI, what's his name? Mironov. 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 He is mentioned as a person who was shooting, but it's in Russian. If you can read Russian, just type in uh, Yandex .ru, I don't Katyn and KVD, and you will find it finally. Uh, over Kimian's file? <sighs> I don't. <laughs> I don't remember now. I don't remember. I saw files on other people. Uh, maybe I saw files on Kimian. I don't remember. Okay, back there. Hello, I'm Norman Kass from the U.S.-Russia Joint Commission on POW MIAs. I'm also an employee of the Defense Department, the U.S. Defense Department. Um, my question is this. In the course of the work that we've been doing with the Russian government over the past uh, 17 years since Presidents uh, Bush and Yeltsin established the commission, uh, we've had occasion to work with representatives of the um, FSB or the KGB, the SVR, the Foreign Intelligence Service, and the GRU. I noticed that you talked today about operational files that you consulted. As you can imagine, when we're trying to look into the question of what the Soviet government knew about the treatment of American prisoners of war, starting with World War II and going forward, the issue of access to intelligence material, both within the intelligence community and within the MVD, becomes particularly important. In each instance that we've attempted to obtain operational files or the information in those files for five years from the time the material is put together. So my question to you is, um, under what arrangements, were there special arrangements worked out for you by which you were able to obtain operational folders for your work um, as the basis for your book, or were there other considerations at play that allowed you to receive it, whereas in our case we have been singularly unsuccessful? Well, there, there, there is a difference between you and me. Uh, I'm Russian, you are American, and it, it, it explains a lot. Not everything, but a lot. Uh, no, no foreign researcher had, as far as I know, maybe I'm wrong, but as far as I know, no foreign researcher had any access to the KGB, but at least uh, of the material uh, to the material of the uh, Soviet intelligence service. Now, that was a special arrangement uh, because there was a project with Crown. There were supposed to be published five books. They did four. The fifth one was supposed to be written by General Volkogonov and uh, Robert Conquest on uh, Trotsky, but I th Volkogonov died and it never happened. Uh, I didn't sign any documents. I didn't see any documents. I didn't sign a paper promising not to reveal this material to anyone. Uh, I guess they just trusted me. And, uh, you know, frankly, I'm not very comfortable about the fact that I betrayed this trust. And, uh, but it just, it just happened uh, because of uh, circumstances. But the work we did, uh, me and other co-authors on the Russian side, was possible only because uh, Boris Yeltsin was president of, of Russia. 
you know, it's, it's Ye you know, Yeltsin's time. Uh, people got extremely rich, and I got access to, to, the, to the files. <laughs> That's my explanation. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't really know how it happened, and uh, I, I don't think there were any legal, legal procedure about it. And 75 years, this is the first time I, I, I'm hearing about it. Okay, Milt, over here. No, no, no. Back where you were before. Raul Kohlberg, uh, presently unaffiliated, but maybe the only person in the room. I'd be interested if there are others who ends up in a KGB training manual. And uh, also uh, briefly an employee of the Committee to Secure Justice in the Rosenberg Sobel case, uh, by way of identification. I, I wanted to ask Alexander with regard to the actual physical logistics of his scene files. I was wondering whether it was the same sort of thing that we'd have here at the National Archives where you're sitting in a reading room and people would bring files to you. Uh, were you actually having access uh, to, to the rooms where files were stored? Uh, was there anything that you a did ask for if that's the system that was involved where somebody brought them to you? You sort of hinted at this that never arrived or was explicitly said that you cannot have this uh, available to you? So, uh, oh, I, I was sitting in, in, a, in a room uh, in the press bureau in Kalpachny Street. I never went to the archives. I went only once to, to the forest. I mean, to, to, to this is what, what we called uh, the headquarters of the Russian intelligence service, just to meet people and to meet uh, the current head of the U.S. Department, B uh, <laughs> but this happened only once. I was I was working in the press bureau, and they were bringing me files from the forest to to the press bureau, usually th three or four volumes. And, and did they ever uh, reject any denials? requests? Ah, uh, denials. Well, there was an initial denial. Uh, the legal department didn't work with it. With, uh, didn't uh, want to, to take part in the project to provide any material for it. Well, uh, Mr. Primakov uh, generally accepted the idea, but he said that uh, the head of every department should decide uh, for himself whether to release it or not. So I d I, there was no cooperation from the illegal department and the technical department. Technical, uh, scientific technical intelligence, but uh, the fact that uh, there were a lot of documents in operational correspondence files helped me. And also the fact that some files officially belonged not to the uh, scientific technical department, but the to, to the U.S. department, which cooperated with the project, <coughs> also helped me. Okay, thank you. Back here, right behind you. Uh, Will Amatruda, Catholic University. Uh, mention was made of a married couple with the surname Glasser. Does anyone know whether they are any relation to Ira Glasser, who was for many years the executive director of the ACLU, uh, mostly in the 1990s, I believe? Earl didn't say in anywhere. No, no. Don't know or not relation? No idea. Okay. No, was, uh, uh, over here. No, no, oh, right here. Yeah, let me just say, is no, there's no relation. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Robert Weinberg. As an alumnus of Yale College and Law School, I want to thank uh, Professor Haynes for assuring us alumni that our contributions are being handled in a very frugal manner. <laughs> <laughs> My two short questions uh, to uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Clare. My professional field is criminal procedure. I'm a retired founding partner of the law firm of Williams and Connolly and uh, an adjunct faculty member in the field of criminal procedure at two good law schools and the author of a recently published article on, on the uh, Hiss perjury conviction, making the point that whether or not Hiss was guilty of spying, he was not, as a matter of law, guilty of perjury on the basis of the transcripts revealed a few years ago in the suit brought by Professor Craig and other legal materials in the archives. My question to Mr. Clare, my first question is, you referred to a document saying that Hiss had been convicted 
of espionage. And I wondered if that was a paraphrase or if the author of the document apparently didn't know that the conviction was a perjury. And, and keep in mind, we'll have a, a panel yes, dealing with this tomorrow. So my question is very limited in We're scope. Find it, yeah. Um, this is a uh, document dated March 16, 1950, uh, talking about plans to reestablish the Soviet intelligence presence in the United States, which had been severely compromised. Uh, and it included a summary of the setbacks of the ni late 1940s. And one of those setbacks was, quoting now from the document, the trial of the GRU, another acronym, Agent Leonard, the chief of one of the main divisions of the State Department and a member of Carl's group, ended in his conviction at the beginning of 1950. Um, unless th there has been uh, a total news blackout, I don't know of any other senior State Department official who was convicted at the beginning of 1950. But it was uh, for perjury uh, as uh, opposed uh, to The point of the question yeah. was, you had stated that c convicted of espionage was well, the term I, I, in the I, document. It, that, and my I, question is, was I, the author of the document aware that the conviction was not of espionage uh, but of perjury? A slight mis uh, misspoken comment on my part. Uh, but as you know, many people have noted, the fact is that uh, Hiss could not be indicted for espionage because the statute of limitations had run out, and everybody understood that the conviction for perjury was, in effect, a, a uh, conclusion that he had committed espionage. Well, we can get into that uh, more tomorrow. tomorrow. My other question was, do the papers make reference to uh, Whitaker Chambers, and if so, under what uh, uh, cover names, and do they make that reference in the context of Alger Hiss or not? Uh, yes, uh, Chambers is identified both with his real name and as Carl. Okay. Is that linking with Hiss? Oh, yes. In yes. the paper, in the it document? Explicitly. Okay. All the way in the back, please. Andre Polishchuk. Uh, I'm a former reporter for the Moscow-based uh, independent newspaper or Nizavisima Gazeta, currently working as a Russian translator for one of the companies in Northern Virginia. And I also have, well, some sort of a personal uh, affiliation to Alexander, Sasha. Uh, we used to study journalism uh, at the Department of Journalism at Moscow State University from 1979 to 1984. Uh, we haven't seen each other for a while, so first of all, welcome to D.C. <laughs> it's, it's a pleasure to see you, buddy. <laughs> and uh, I have a very quick question, actually. Uh, he's been a uh, asked a lot of tough questions, so my mine is pretty simple. Uh, given that you have donated all your notebooks to the Library of Congress, uh, uh, would it be accurate to assume that uh, you are kind of done and there will be no more books on, on the history of the Soviet slash Russian KGB in the future. Thank you. Spasiba. <laughs> you mean no more books from him? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> probably, yeah, um, yeah I, I think I'm through with history. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you just started. Yeah. I, I'm writing fiction now, you know, spy novels. <laughs> 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 I just finished the first one and writing the second one. I kind of hope that it will become my new career, but uh, I don't know yet because I, I, I don't have a publisher and I, I, I'm not sure if it will happen to me or not. I had a dream of about becoming a, a professional um, historian when I started working with uh, John and, and um, Harvey and I had this dream for a few months uh, because <laughs> I, <laughs> I realized it's, it's a very tough job. Sometimes it's very boring, you know, the list, the index of, to, of this book is on 150 pages, I think, right? And it doesn't pay much. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, you know, I, <laughs> I my hopes are on, you know, in fiction. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, over here. John Wilhelm, a, a Washington-based writer. Uh, you mentioned Volkoganov uh, in the early stages of the His chapter, and I'm, I'm curious, what your assessment is as to whether uh, he was cherry picked, he was given cherry picked files uh, that did not contain any of the HIST material, or whether he uh, in fact uh, prevaricated? I, I, I think that he simply lied. Yeah. 
Okay. And that was very stupid. Did you ever run a crossing? No. Did you have any? No. no. I don't, I, frankly, you know, I personally, uh, I don't consider him a real historian. Uh, just his, his books on Lenin and Stalin, them, you know, it's, uh, it's there, these are works of a public, of a journalist, maybe, but they're not history works. And the fact that he lied about such, a, such an important matter, it, this says it all. Okay. Greg Herkin. Uh, Greg Herkin, University of California. I was, uh, to Alexandra, I was curious if, if you found in the KGB documents any embedded GRU documents, uh, and uh, also if you have any idea whether the GRU kept as extensive notes or as extensive files, I should say, uh, on their agents. Uh, I, uh, I, I've got no, I, I know nothing about the, uh, the GRU files. I actually, Volkogonov said, and that, that time he, he said true, truth, that uh, probably that uh, the GRU files were also I in a total mess. In this, I believe him because uh, the KGB files are, you know, total mess. Uh, there are s sometimes people from uh, from the Guru networks got into KGB files, and uh, well, an example is uh, Al uh, There were, uh, there are also a, a few documents summarizing the joint summarizing both the work of GRO and KGB in America. I think there is a, an extensive document about a do document, uh, a report to, to Beria and Stalin uh, in connection to Earl Browder. And this, uh, but I saw only a, co only a KGB copy and um, where they had a number of agents, uh, the place, uh, the spot for the number of Gare U agents was, was blank. But these, these are very few examples. No, the, the, the I don't remember any Gare U document, frankly. Yeah. Greg, I don't know if it's behind your question, but I, I suspect if we're ever going to get to the bottom of the Chevalier case, we'll, we'll, we'll need GRU. Yeah, uh, the that's, that's the problem. Yes. Okay. We're almost out of time, so let's collect the last few comments and questions, and then we'll uh, have a couple minutes for the panelists. Okay, over here, please. My name is Jeff Kisloff. I run a website, uh, algerhist.com. Um, we'll be running a, a review of the material here uh, in depth, I hope. Um, I think what we found is there's a lot of contradictory evidence to what's presented in the book. And um, uh, I did want to ask uh, Mr. Vasiliev, isn't it true that General Kobyakov actually did the research for Volkogonov? I've got no idea. Yes. Uh, he actually did an interview with us here in Washington in 2005 and said the request landed on his desk. And he's the one that did the research. And he also did considerable research through the KGB files and found that there was no evidence that Alger Hiss was a spy. Now, we, we can disagree on that, but uh, I'm just telling you what General Kobiakov said. And I, I did want to raise one point, which is, uh, you know, our concern is that there is information which goes contrary to what's presented in the book. And for example, let me just give you but one example. Maybe we, maybe we should focus on this tomorrow, because we will have well, a Well, let me just give you one example, and then we could focus on it tomorrow, because okay. David Salmon's name came up uh, at length here today. Uh, he was outed as an agent. And I I isn't it not true that whether or not you ag agree or disagree with it or not, in uh, General Kobayakov's book, Paper Mill, which was published in 2003, uh, there's considerable evidence that General Kobayakov presented that David Salmon was not Willie and that uh, Leo uh, Ludwig Lorry was lying when he said that Willie was David Salmon, actually the Soviet agents investigated, followed David Salmon, and found out that David Salmon, that when Ludwig Lorry presented uh, his willy to suspicious uh, Soviet agents, uh, the fellow that Lorry presented was about 40 years old, spoke with a German accent, but David Salmon was born in 1879, had been a, uh, an employee of the State Department, I guess, through the 1890s. 
And uh, again, I mean, there might be contrary evidence to this, and you might disagree with General Kobiakov's findings, but shouldn't it be uh, uh, proper uh, to com put this information in the book so at least let readers make their decision about whether or not uh, this information is true? Okay. Um, is it very quick? Yes. The, okay. the, the book you're referring to is a, is a, uh, a KGB apology, essentially saying the agency always did everything right. Any mistakes we made were due to agent betrayals, and uh, it really is a, uh, a book where if we tried to deal with every excuse given in the book, we would have spent half the book dealing with their excuses. That is not a book of original documentation. It is an apology. And Actually, he saw Ludwig Lorry's personal file before he wrote the book. Okay. Let's continue that tomorrow sure. since we're about out of time. Mark Kramer has a comment. Just, just very quickly on, um, I, I did actually speak with Volker Garnoff about it and knew him a bit. I would disagree with um, Alexander. I, I don't think it was Volker Garnoff who lied. I think it was Kabyakov who did. And uh, frankly, I don't trust a word he says. Okay. Any uh, final questions because we're just about out of time? In that case, um, let me tell you all that we uh, will be reassembling to get into the nitty-gritty after this cursory introduction to the issues. Um, let me ask you all to join me in thanking our panelists and invite you back for tomorrow.